Welcome to this talk on Adaptive Security of Practical Gardening Scheme. This is joint work with Zaha Jafagoli, who works for the company CPO, and I'm Sabina Oechner, and I'm at Aarhus University. So the first question we need to answer is what is a gardening scheme? But for that, let's take a step back and look at secure multi-party computation. Um, secure multi-party computation is the following problem. Assume we have a number of parties, say three, and each party has a private input, say x1, x2, x3. And now they want to compute a public function f of their private inputs. And they want to do it such that the um, protocol is correct, um, meaning that the parties learned the correct function evaluation result. And we want the protocol to be private, meaning that no party learns anything about the other party's inputs, other than what the output leaks. So a famous example by Yao is uh, Yao's garbage circuits approach, which was actually also the first protocol in this um, for the setting. Um, it's a two-party computation protocol. So we have two parties, P1 and P2, um, holding private inputs uh, X1 and X2, and they want to compute a public function F. So in this protocol, we have uh, the parties take on two different roles, that of an evaluator or a garbler. And so the protocol starts by P2, who is the garbler. Um, so first of all, we assume that the function F is actually going to be represented as a wooden circuit, and we're going to call that circuit C. So the garbler starts by computing a garbling, or think of it as an encryption of the circuit, which you're going to denote by C tilde, plus some information um, for dealing with inputs and outputs, that's E and Z. Then the next step is that both garbler and evaluator need to also garble their own inputs, so that then later the evaluator can um, evaluate the garbled circuit on the garbled inputs. So for the garbler, it's easy. The garbler can just uh, garble their own inputs. But for the evaluator, um, it's not as easy because the garbler is not supposed to learn x1, the evaluator's input. So what they're going to do is they're going to run a separate protocol, um, an oblivious transfer protocol, in which the evaluator is going to input their input, the garbler is going to input this input encoding information or garbling information E, and then the evaluator is going to learn a garbling of their own input. So now the garbler can send um, the garbled uh, circuit, their own garbled input, and some uh, decoding information to the evaluator, who then can evaluate the garbled circuit on the combined garbled inputs to learn some garbled output, and then decode the garbled output, and then possibly send the result back to P2. So this protocol gets semi-honest security. The underlying construction here is pointed out by Belara, Huang, and Rogova in 2012 is what they call a garbling scheme, which is a tuple of algorithms um, that's shown in this uh, picture here from their paper. So um, we have five algorithms. We have the uh, a circuit garbling algorithm GB, which is probabilistic. We have an input encoding algorithm or input garbling algorithm EN, an output decoding algorithm DE, and then two evaluation algorithms. One for garbled circuit evaluation, which um, evaluates the garbled circuit and garbled inputs, and then the regular circuit evaluation, which evaluates the circuit and inputs. And so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to assume that the garbling schemes that you're interested in are projective, meaning that, um, well, like we have a Boolean circuit, so um, the input is going to be a bit string, but projective means that the um, input encoding is actually a bitwise function. So you can encode the inputs, uh, input bits one by one. So let's look back at the Yao's Gabel circuits example, look at concretely at the Yao's Gabel scheme, how that works, because that's going to be interesting for the rest of the talk. So I'm just going to briefly sketch the basic idea, but it works as follows. You're going to um, look at each wire and you're going to assign two bit strings and I'm going to call keys to each wire. The idea is to interpret them as encodings of the bit values that the wire can take. So there's one key that will correspond to a bit value one on the wire, and the other one is going to be zero. Now to encode an input, all you have to do is map the bits of the input to the corresponding keys on the input wires. Um, for To garble the gates of a circuit, we have to do something a bit differently, and we're going to compute four ciphertexts. So that's, going, that's shown in this little drawing here. So assume we have two keys on each wire. We have two input wires, we have one output wire, and that could potentially be input to multiple gates and later. So the idea is that you're going to encrypt the output wire keys under each combination of corresponding input wire keys. So um, what that gives you is um, something that uh, you can use to evaluate then later. You can use, basically, you can use the input wire keys to decrypt the gate ciphertext and then learn the output wire keys. And then once you have that, you can decode the result 
And for that, you need to map a you need to uh, a map from upper wire keys to bits, which is also going to be provided. Okay, so the title talks about practical gathering schemes. So what do I mean by that? Basically, I'm talking about optimizations to YAO's gathering schemes, and there are actually quite a few. The idea of all of them is that you want to reduce the garbled circuit size, and you do that by correlating wire keys in different ways. So if you think about YAO's gathering scheme, then the garbled circuit consists mostly of ciphertexts. In particular, it's four ciphertexts per gate. And all these optimizations get down the number of ciphertexts you need per gate. So there's three row reduction, that's the first one here, um, which gets the number of ciphertexts down to three. There's two row reduction, which gets the number down to two. And there's three exo, which allows you to gobble exo gates without ciphertexts. Um, there's half gate, which is an, um, an optimization of free XOR. And then there's another Gabriel scheme by, by Guerin, Lindell, um, North and Pinkers, which is an in-between thing. So the next thing I want to talk about is adaptive security. For that, I want to define security briefly. So the security notion proposed by Belau, Hong, and Rogaway, which turned out to be the standard security notion that is used nowadays, is um, a simulation-based security notion, and it looks as follows. We have two games. We have a real game and an ideal game. In the real game, um, we have an adversary that chooses um, a circuit to be garbled and an input to be garbled. And then the game is going to garble both and output a circuit garbling and an input garbling. In the ideal game, on the other hand, we also have an adversary, of course, who chooses again X and Z. And the simulator now also has to output a circuit garbling and an input garbling. But the simulator does not get the input X, but only C of X, and also C. And then we say that a gathering scheme has selective security if there exists a probabilistic polynomial time simulator S such that the two games' outputs are computationally indistinguishable for any adversary. So which schemes are, which schemes are secure under the selective security notion? Um, and that's well, it's a standard notion. So, like every scheme has every scheme that I talked about, it has selective security. And that's actually enough in most applications. So, how does one prove that? So, I'm going to briefly sketch like the idea of the selective security proof for Yao's gathering scheme. So, let's focus here in this small example on a single gate. So, this is the picture I had before. Now, how does the proof uh, go? So the crucial observation is here that the game needs to output a garbled circuit and a garbled input at the same time. So that means that when you garble the circuit, you already know the input. So what that means is that um, you know that a circuit evaluator, which is the, the adversary here, is going to learn exactly one key of your circuit. So for the input wires, that is clear because uh, your adversary is going to learn like um, one key per Y, which corresponds to the input, and I've marked those in blue here. So in the, pic in the left picture, all the blue keys are the keys as an adversary learns. So in particular, what you can see here is that the adversary is going to learn only one of the two upper wire keys, again, if they only know one of the two input wire keys. So we're going to use this observation now in the proof in the following way. Now, because the adversary never gets to see the second uh, output wire key, we can actually change the encryptions a bit. And we're going to change them so that all ciphertexts here are going to contain the same message, which is the wire key that the adversary sees. We call this one the active wire key. Um, so the first gate I'm going to call that a real gate. And the second one is an input dependent simulation because you're starting to simulate, but you're not fully simulating yet because you actually still know the output, uh, sorry, the input. So the final step is then a gate where there's no notion of input anymore. That is then a full simulation. So instead of having a wire keys that correspond to zero or one, I just have an active wire key, which is what my adversary is going to see. And I have an inactive wire key, which is the one the adversary is not going to see. And then I um, compute the gate garbling based on this active inactive semantic instead of the zero one semantic. So um, once we've seen that for a gate, 
then the security proof becomes relatively simple because then it consists of a sequence of hybrids where um, we start from a circuit with where all gates are in this real gate mode that I showed you before. That means they are garbled according to the real garbling schemes. And then I can switch the gates gate wise, this input dependent simulated node, input dependent simulation node mode. <laughs> Meaning I have then an intermediate, so I have a bunch of intermediate games where I keep changing gates. And then I have a game where all gates use this input dependent simulation. And then I can continue swapping around, uh, switching around gates until I have a game which, where all the gates are simulated. And because each step is uh, indistinguishable, the real game and the ideal game are indistinguishable. So this all makes sense. But now you can ask the question, um, if I look at Yao's garbling scheme, there's nothing that forces me to garble the circuit and the input together. So can't you garble them separately? Um, and the answer is yes, you can. It's in principle possible. Um, Yao's garbling scheme allows you that. You can even um, garble the input before the circuit if you want to, if you have already chosen the wire keys. Um, and then it's actually also convenient in some settings. For example, if you're running an MPC protocol in the pre-processing model, you might want to garble the circuit in the pre-processing phase. And then you want to, might want to garble the input during the actual online phase. But there is a problem here. What could possibly go wrong? And that is that the security notion does not capture that and the selective security proof does not apply anymore. Why is that the case? That's what I'm pointing at with the arrow. Um, the proof relies on that it can mark some keys as blue, meaning they are visible to an adversary with their active keys, because those are the ones that correspond to the input. But if I gamble the circuit first before an input is chosen, then there's no notion of what the adversary is going to see. So my proof strategy just completely collapses. And that is where adaptive security comes in. I can define, so ad adaptive security is defined um, or can be defined in the following way. That is also Bilaro, Hong, and Blogger Bay, um, a different paper. The first one was uh, CCS 2012, and this is Adacrypt 2012. Um, so they defined another game for adaptive security of guarding schemes, which looks as follows. We have a real game where the adversary first chooses a circuit to be garbled, and then the game garbles that. And then the adversary chooses an input based on that adaptively. So after seeing the garbled circuit, and then the game can garble um, the circuit, sorry, the game garbles the input now. And in the idea game, we have the same, except there's a simulator now. So the adversary chooses a circuit, then the simulator has to garble the circuit, then the adversary chooses X, and then the simulator gets C of X, not X, but just C of X, and has to output um, a garbled X. And again, um, we say that a garbled scheme has adaptive security, and those two games are indistinguishable. So what is known in a setting? We actually do know quite a bit and not too much, in some sense. So first of all, they're like positive results. We actually know how to get adaptive security. Um, in different ways, like a couple of transformations. Um, actually, Bilal, Huang, and Rogaway proposed a couple themselves um, based on one type of encryption, where you um, encrypt the whole garbled circuit with one type of encryption, or based on the programmable and random oracle model. Um, the idea here is, or in all these transformations, is that you would want to equivocate during the proof. So you want to change the messages inside the garbled circuit. Um, Later, one way to do it is one type of encryption. Another way to do it is using a programmable or a random oracle and like reprogramming the whole random oracle. Then there's another transformation based uh, on universally composable, no, UCEs. And um, then there's another construction based on somewhere equivocal encryption. So you don't need to equivocate the full um, socket gambling, but you can say where you want to equivocate and it gives you a little efficiency. So what all these transformations um, have in common is that they are either inefficient as the, um, well, basically everything except for the, the, the one time pad one and the somewhere equivalent encryption, or they rely on non-standard assumptions like a programmable random oracle or the UCs. Then there's a second type of results, 
which is uh, we can also get at that to security without modifying a construction. So the first one is kind of the naive one, which is you can try to guess the input, but that incurs an exponential security loss because you have to guess the whole input. The chances of get it, getting the right input when you gather the circuit is small. But then if you guess right, then you can use the same strategy as the selective security proof. And then there's one final other result by Jeff Ogoli and Wicks, 2016, it was TCC, um, which, and they showed that Yao's gouging scheme as is actually has adaptive security if you gobble NC1 circuits. <coughs> so the question that we ask here is, what about adaptive security of practical gobbling schemes, of like optimizations of Yao's gouging scheme? Can we say anything about that? If Yao's gouging scheme has adaptive security as is, at least for NC1 circuits, what about other gobbling schemes? So this is what the rest of the problem is going to be about. What about other schemes? Um, and to answer this question, or to try to answer this question, um, our starting point is the um, JW proof technique. So we have two kinds of results. Um, we are examining when the JW technique will not work. And then we have a positive result, which is we have a new adaptively secure construction and can show that like techniques for adaptively or for like Galvan schemes have adaptive security. Yes, in particular, that is the case for Fourier reduction and then the point and permute technique does is not in the way of adaptive security. And then we actually show a new construction, which is a variant of the uh, garden scheme of Guerin et al. But first, since everything is like based on this uh, JW technique, let's do a quick recap. So again, what goes wrong in the selective security proof and how do Jeff Agoli and Vicks deal with that to get adaptive security? Um, what goes wrong is that, so in the selective security proof, you can gobble the circuit and the input at the same time. So in particular, you have this notion of active wire keys. That is, you know which wire keys your uh, circuit evaluator or the adversary is going to see once the input is fixed. And now in an adaptive security proof, the input is not fixed at the time of circuit gobbling. So you cannot use this information. So what Jeff Agoli and Wicks do is um, they just guess the input to the gate. But we just talked about that just simply guessing the whole input does not work. So the challenging here is um, to limit the number of guesses. So instead of having to guess the whole input, you guess, you repeatedly guess small parts of the input. <coughs> so the observations that makes that work is that um, you only really need to guess whatever is um, relevant for the gates that are currently in this input dependent simulation mode for both real gambling and simulated gambling and the selective security proof, you don't actually need to know what the input was. And so the trick is the following. For Yao's gambling scheme, as I said before, um, like your typical um, proof strategy is you start from a garbled circuit where all the gates are garbled according to the real gambling scheme. And you want to get to a game where all the gates are garbled according to a simulated gambling scheme. And you do that by first making all the games input dependent simulated gambling and then make them all simulated. <coughs> Sorry. So what uh, Jeff Agoli and Vicks showed that you can actually do this in a slightly different way. So you do not have to go from real to input dependent simulated gambling for the whole circuit, but actually you can be more fine grained. You can, um, starting from the top, if you have all real gates, you can starting from the top do um, input dependent simulated gobbling and then immediately go to simulated gobbling. So you can have all three modes in the same circuit at one time, which means that allows you to limit the number of gates that are in input dependent simulated mo gobbling mode at any point in time. So the challenge is still how do you limit the number of guesses to do? And so they find a solution here, which is you define the pebbling game where the number of guesses corresponds to the number of pebbles, and then you optimize. Try to find a pebbling strategy which results in the smallest number of pebbles. And they can actually show that 
for MC1 circuits, there's a padding strategy which results in polynomial security loss and not exponential. Um, now, if you want to take these results and apply them to optimizations of the alpha doubling scheme, we have to revisit how these optimizations actually work. So there are two classes. One is you derive output Y keys deterministically from input Y keys. That is, for example, a free row reduction um, where you um, set, so you have three ciphertexts that are four, and the fourth ciphertext is implicit. You're going to set that to the zero string. <coughs> and you're going to obtain one of the output Y keys by decrypting that one. So you're kind of going backwards. Um, that means one of the output wire keys is going to be computed based on the input wire keys, and the other one is going to be random. That saves you one second text. And another kind of optimization trick is to correlate keys across wires. For example, the free XR technique uses that. And the idea here is that um, you introduce a shared wire key offset. So for each wire, you do not choose two random keys. But instead, you choose one key and then compute the second key using the offset from the first key. <coughs> so now to our results. What could possibly go wrong if you try to prove adaptive security of these Galbing schemes? Um, under no further assumptions, no transformations. So the first thing that can go wrong is um, Kind of a, a trivial one. If your selective security proof is a global argument instead of a sequence of hybrid with local changes, then there's no chance of applying the JW technique. So for example, in free XOR, all Y keys are correlated, which means that um, you have to rely on an assumption that this correlation cannot be detected, which is going to be a global assumption over all over the whole circuit. And so what I'm circling in blue here is that this um, <coughs> is having different um, gates and different modes is not possible in this case. The second thing that could go wrong is that um, not only one of the output Y keys is uniquely determined by the input Y keys, but actually both. And the problem here is that creates a dependency between a gate and all its predecessors. That is, for example, the case in, in the anything that uses two-row reduction that gets the Gabel circuit size down, or the, the Gabel gate size down to two ciphertexts. So the problem here is like what I circled in the middle picture is that um, you can, of course, now um, have a sequence of hybrids where you first go, uh, you have all gates in like real gate mode, then you have all, then you move to like a gate where you have all hybrids, uh, where you have all gates in input dependent simulation mode and into simulation mode, but you cannot mix all three now, because <coughs> both real and simulated are input independent, um, whereas the input dependent simulation is actually dependent on inputs. And um, also there is a dependency between the gates and this like, layout of input dependent simulated nodes, uh, gates, and its predecessors. So if there's an input dependence here, there's also an input dependence in all the predecessors. So you can have these three um, types mixed in the same game. <coughs> Finally, I would like to talk about a new construction. Um, so after these negative results, like um, a lot of gambling schemes do not have, cannot be shown to have adaptive security using the JW technique, I will show you a new construction which we actually proved to have adaptive security and which is more efficient than the ALS gambling scheme. So this construction is going to have adaptive security for NC1 circuits based on pseudo-random functions. Um, it's going to use the point of view technique, showing that that is not in the way of adaptive security. And the construction achieves, uh, it can gather XL gates with two ciphertexts and end gates with three ciphertexts. That is actually a typo on the slide. And for those of you who are familiar with the construction, um, this is a modification of the construction by Göran, Lindell, and and Pinkers. So how does the construction work? Um, for end gates, the best thing we could do was use three-row reduction, as I said before. Um, 
and three-row reduction, um, you save one ciphertext. And that is compatible with this uh, proof technique. And for an XOR gate, we can actually get it down to two ciphertexts. And that works in the following way. So you assume we're given two uh, input wire keys per input wire. So we have four keys where the left wire is A and the right wire is B. And then um, we're going to choose a fresh random gate offset delta. So this is the <coughs> this is the difference between um, the construction by Gironadal and like our construction that we use a fresh random gate offset here. Then the next step is to translate the zero input wire keys. Oh, by the way, I'm the construction uses point and permute, but I'm describing it without point and permute because that is easier to describe um, here. But you will have to add point and permute to that. That's described in the paper. Check out the paper if you're interested in the um, complete description. So the first step now is to translate the, <coughs> the zero input wire keys. That is, um, you're going to re-randomize the inputs um, that go into the gate to make them independent of circuits, uh, sorry, of, of like gates around them. And yes, so um, to translate the zero wire key on the wire A, we're going to compute um, f of g, the, the gate index, um, with the, the where the PRF is keyed with k0, and the same for b0. <coughs> and then we're going to compute the translated one wire keys as the zero wire key x or the offset. And then you can set the output wire keys Um, in the following way. So you set the zero key to be the XOR of the zero keys on the input wires. And you set the one key to be the zero key XOR delta. And then very similarly to like um, free XOR or the the, uh, the, the construction by Guerlain-Nodal, you can now evaluate this. And finally, um, we're going to compute ciphertext. We're going to need two ciphertexts that are used to evaluate the circuit. Um, there's one ciphertext, which is <coughs> basically encrypting the translated one wire key under the actual one wire key and the same on the, on the B wire and one for the A wire as well. Yes, and that gives you a construction with um, adaptive security with um, AND gates um, that can be garbled with three ciphertexts and exo gates with two ciphertexts. So let me briefly summarize um, what happened in this work. Um, we revisited the JW security proof for other practical garbling schemes, that is optimizations of Yao's garbling scheme. And we discussed that many existing garbling schemes do not seem to be provably adaptively secure with the existing techniques under standard assumptions. That's our negative result. And the positive result is that um, there are actually more efficient garbling schemes than the ask gambling schemes that also have provably adaptive security. And that is free row reductions, which we used for the end gates, but which could also be used for exo gates if you wanted to. Um, the point of permute technique is not in the way of adaptive security. And then we have a new construction which actually improves over free row reduction. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>